this morning, Thomas and I, I got a chance to meet each other in person. We were out there in Loudoun County uh, at, in Leesburg at the Office of Elections there. So many great Americans gathering together to cast their ballots today in early voting in the Commonwealth. Uh, and Thomas stepped up and said, hey, I called you two years ago, and uh, I have an update for you on this story. So I thought it'd be, it would be nice if Thomas could share it with all of us. Thomas joins us now on the phone. Hello, Thomas. Good to have you back on the show, sir. Hey, Vince. It's great to uh, great to be here. Thanks uh, for inviting me. It's great to meet you this morning, you and Corey. Um, great to see you out there. Thanks for coming out to Loudoun. It was it was a great event. Uh, so many great people, and uh, including yourself. And uh, uh, Thomas, you know, this is I I when I listen to this audio, I remember this call and thinking, man, this is what a rough situation this gentleman is in. Uh, that uh, you're being deceived by the very school system that you work for about the status of your daughter. And there are people within the school system, apparently, who, who are filling your daughter's head with all sorts of lies about herself. Give us uh, a sense of, of where the journey went from there. What happened? Yeah, it was, um, <clears throat> as I told you at the time, you know, it was, a, it was a shock to my wife and I when we found this out. And it was, it was almost the end of school um, when we did find out. It was, it was almost by accident that we found out. And, uh, you know, we, we really felt kind of betrayed because, you know, as parents, you know, obviously we feel that we have, you know, the first say in, in what's happening in our daughter's life. And um, just to kind of find it out, you know, almost accidentally that this was going on and that you know, they were kind of supporting her in that. That was a, a real shock to the system, a, a kind of a betrayal, like I said. And, um, but as you said, you know, there's there's good news in the story. Um, we decided at that point, um, through the help of some uh, some dear friends in our church, um, we were able to kind of put her into a private school. Um, and, uh, it's interesting, you know, the, the very first day of that school, this was two years ago, um, you know, she really didn't want to go. She was upset about it. And, and my wife and I told her, look, just go into it with an open mind. You don't have to love it. We're not asking you to love it, but, uh, please don't go into it, you know, thinking you're going to hate it. Just give it a chance. And at the end of that very first day, when I picked her up, uh, I hadn't seen her smile in a long time, but she was smiling. She was laughing. She'd made a, a good friend group, which I think is a big part of the story. Um, and uh, since then, over the past two years, um, she's come to realize, you know, that she wasn't actually, you know, a boy. She wasn't uh, a transgender person, um, and it's, uh, it's it's really worked out in a positive way. And I, I think a big a big part of that is just the fact that, you know, my wife and I didn't accept the narrative that that we were being told um, about how, you know, um, gender dysphoria works or how you know, a person her age at the time, she was only 13, um, can make those sort of decisions for herself. You know, you, you get a lot of information from schools, you get a lot of information from, uh, you know, just people um, who tell you that, you know, if you kind of fight against this or, or, or you know, try to speak against this, that, you know, you're going to put your child at risk, they're at yes. more risk for suicide, things like that. And that's, that's just not true in this case, for sure. It's unbelievable. So you said that um, you're, you had friends from church who helped. Uh, does that mean that you put her in a Christian school? Is that when you say private school? Yeah, it was, it was a Christian private school. Um, she's still there now. Um, and, you know, the, the, the one of the things that was a big part of the story, I think when she was at the, the Loudoun County School, of course, you know, the, the teachers, and I'm, I'm a teacher in Loudoun County, you know, there's a sort of like uh, idea that we're, we're not allowed to kind of speak out against these things. And so, when a student sort of says, hey, I'm now a boy or I'm now a girl and they want to change their names, you know, we're supposed to kind of support that. And at, at the time, especially, we weren't supposed to mention anything to the parents. And so, you know, this, this sort of happens uh, with adults that they trust. Um, and so, you know, in their lives, when yes. they're getting sort of this information from adults. And then, of course, when they have a friend group that's sort of supporting this because it's, it's uh, the normal thing to do, so to speak. Um, it's it's really sort of become a social contagion, so, which which in her case I think is what it was. You know, there's there's obviously people that suffer from gender dysphoria, and and I, you know I think those people need compassion and respect, and you know uh, obviously medical you know advice and things like that. Um, yeah. But uh, but you know when you just have young girls, especially who are being sort of told these lies about themselves, you know they're they're impressionable, they're going to believe it, and. Um, you know, there's a lot of harm that comes from that. It's fortunately, yeah. not not in the case of my daughter. But. Right. Yeah. The last thing you want to do with someone is enable their destruction. You want to rescue them right. from that, obviously. And so um, you said it was the friend group. I assume typically with with girls, it's like their friends are almost all girls, maybe with some exceptions. Uh, and and yeah. you're making me think about um, 
there was a book that written by Abigail Schreier called Irreversible Damage. And she, she wrote uh, quite a bit about this, that especially among young women, that it's a social contagion, that, it, that, it'll, that an entire group of girls will all begin saying that actually we're boys uh, in unison, uh, at suggesting, of course, that this is just a, a matter of, of, of social decision making. Uh, was that what you found? Yeah, and it's actually it's interesting that you mentioned that book. You know, when this this happened, of course, I decided to try to you know educate myself quite a bit to kind of figure out what was going on, and that was one of the books I read. Um, and you know that it, what what um, the author said in that book, um, I could see, of course, in my own daughter's life. You know, kind of looking at it from that perspective, and then of course, you know, thinking about my own teaching experiences, uh, same thing. You know, um, it, it seems to be a large population of, of younger girls that sort of um, Kind of buy into this um you know their friend groups will sort of do that um, it becomes almost popular or cool to kind of be that way um and again i'm not saying that's in every case i mean there are, as i said there are you know real cases of people who have you know a, a mental um you know condition gender dysphoria yes, yes they um, have which, confusion which, uh, about their own gender right. but but they shouldn't yeah, be led astray but, into thinking that they're a mistake this this is what i sure. preach all the time it's like your, your body is not a mistake your body's not a mistake. Right. Don't let anybody convince you of that. Yeah, and that's that's what we've been working with my daughter on. And as I said, over those past two years, you know, after that first year of being at the school, um, she had basically developed a new friend group that, you know, basically were friends with her because of who she was and not yes. because of like, you know, just how the, they could the, use her social fad. Yeah. yeah. And same thing with the teachers, you know, I mean, and, and you know, it's interesting because at, at the school she's at now, I mean, these aren't issues that are even really promoted or talked about it's not like it's part of an agenda or something like that so i think being out of an environment where that was sort of like in her face all the time yeah um really helped and you know we as i said we we didn't try to convince her that she was going to like the school or anything like that but she she really did like it and it's decided she's been there this is her, to start of her third year there and uh I'm, I'm happy to say you know she's she's not thinking that she's a boy anymore she's not thinking you know, that she wants to be part of that transgender movement. She's, uh, you know, uh, basically behaving like you would think a normal 16-year-old sure. or almost 16-year-old girl would so be. So what does she think of that era of her life now, looking back on it? How does she, how does she assess it? Yeah, you know, it's an interesting question. And, and you know, it's, it's still a little close to the, the time when that was happening. So, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, my wife and I still kind of approach it, you know, carefully. Um, but I think she looks back on that with, uh, you know, a sense of, you know, sympathy maybe to people that are going through these things. Um, you know, she's got a big heart for people. Um, and so, you know, I think she, she looks at that time as, you know, I think she's glad she's out of it, um, out of that situation. You know, we've asked her if she wanted to go back to, you know, a different school, but, a, you know, a public school, she doesn't want to do that. Um, and I, I think she can feel, you know, a lot of sort of concern for people that are going through the same thing as, as yeah. her that she went through. So, can I, um, I, 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 by the way, I'm so grateful, Thomas, that you're sharing all of this because I think it's instructive. And I, and I know that one of the reasons you are sharing it is kind of as a, a way to, to give um, other parents out there some sense of hope about how to navigate yeah, these definitely. issues. Yeah. Uh, one, one question I have, and it may be a bit personal, but I don't, I don't know if this is your daughter's situation, but um, one of the other things that we often see with uh, girls who are convinced of this that they're boys. It's not just a matter of social contagion. There's also high degrees of correlations of autism that young mm -hmm. uh, Chloe, Chloe Cole, for instance, as she's told us, uh, she's, she's very famously gone through all of this and had a lot of regret about the way that she was exploited and treated. Uh, and she's talked about, you know, she has autism and that that was taken advantage of. Uh, did you detect that with say your daughter's friend group at all? Was, was that something that you noticed? Um, you know, not necessarily. Um, I think my daughter's friend group was more um, sort of like trying to find a place for themselves. They didn't really fit into the, you know, the popular, you know, what you would might call the pretty girl group. They sure. weren't super nerdy necessarily, you know, they, you know, they were trying to find their own way. And so I think, I think that was more of the case though. I, though I will say, you know, my daughter, she, she doesn't have autism or anything like that, but you know, she does have some executive functioning sort of things that we're, we've been dealing with. And, right. um, you know, she's just, uh, you know, she's, <laughs> she's doing great in school and everything like that, but yeah, she yeah. doesn't, she isn't, doesn't have autism. But I, I think for her group is more just, uh, you know, trying to find who they wanted to be, you know, like yeah. most teenagers do, you know, they're trying to fit in. Right. And for whatever reason, you know, that was sort of what 
seemed like the the fit at the time. Yeah, and, um, and kids are really kids are decent, much. and those that decency can be exploited, and they're impressionable. Yeah. It's, this is, I mean, it's a really wild time, and uh, and and so many people are led astray in so many directions. Uh, yeah. through, throughout the generations, this is one of the latest iterations of that. As a teacher in Loudoun County Schools, it must drive you crazy that the school system encourages this kind of deceit with the parents. Uh, how, how has yeah. it changed your view of all of that? You know, it's, um, you know, and I got to be a little bit careful, I guess, what I say. I don't want to, you know, I, I still need my job. But, I um, respect you that. Know, it, 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 it is very frustrating, um, you know, because not only am I a teacher and I, of course I'm a father who's sort of seen this, but I'm, I'm also a, a Christian and a believer. And um, so, you know, when I have a student that is, you know, going through something like this, of course, you know, my first thought is that I have concern for this person. You know, I, I want them to live a happy, healthy life. And, you know, it's, you know, I, I want, obviously I'm hoping that their parents are involved with these sort of things and um, just to sort of be stymied in that, um, and not even be able to offer like my perspective, but you know, the idea is that I kind of have to give the, the party line, so to speak. Yeah. Um, it, it's very, very frustrating. Um, you know, I, I question a lot, you know, am I actually, you know, being a teacher in some ways doing a disservice to students in these situations? Um, you know, it's, I think, I think all these things really need to happen in the home. I don't necessarily think it's a teacher's or a school's place to be teaching, you know, uh, sexuality, sexuality and ethics to, to a large degree. I mean, I think it needs to start at home. Um, but, you know, and of course, it, it seems like in our school system, that's what they're trying to like not let you do. They want to take care of it at the school. And I, I just think that's, uh, yeah, that's the wrong, wrong way well, to go. And, it, and as you said, it is frustrating. So. And, and there are all sorts of things in our, in our, in our culture, in our country, where, um, you know, people who are given positions of responsibility are, have duties to report, you know, where they have an obligation to report uh, things that are traumatic or important or abuse uh, in order to exactly. try and rescue yeah. a child. And, and this is one of those categories that's been inverted uh, when it comes to this issue of, of young kids who are convinced that they were born in the wrong bodies. And it's what a, what a disgrace that that's, that's the case. I will say, Thomas, yeah. uh, you and your wife, um, uh, you know, you stood up for your daughter, you took care of her. And uh, this is, that's a, that's, this is such a great story because, um, she's totally irreplaceable and, uh, you as her father stood up for her, you did the exact right thing. And thank God you did. And, uh, I'm so well, grateful you, you came Vince, back to yeah. update us. Yeah. You know, I couldn't have done it without obviously my faith, my church and my friends. Um, you know, it, it was a big decision and, you know, a, kind of a costly decision too. And, but, you know, as you said, you know, I wouldn't change anything. I mean, my daughters uh, and all my children, I have three other children, um, you know, they're, they're definitely worth it and worth that fight. So, yeah, I, I hope uh, other parents are maybe encouraged by this. And, uh, you know, I really appreciate you inviting me to come give an update. So. Thomas, so nice to meet you today and so great to hear this story. I'm, I love how it turned out. God bless you and thank you very much. Look forward to seeing you again in the future, sir. Yeah, hope so, Vince. God bless you, too.